2,000 years ago, Jesus looked out at the vast crowd and he had pity on them. I wonder what our Lord thinks today as he looks out at the vast crowd of humanity all over the world, especially in our country. I'm sure he looks and he has pity on us. He looks at our pain. If he watched the six o'clock news this evening, as I did, he had a lot of pain. They were talking about that terrible shooting in Paducah, Kentucky, in, in that school. We see these things compounding as time goes on. We look at the world and at our society through tears and blood. We wonder what's gone wrong. We see fighting, factions, wars multiplying. Our young people killing themselves and each other at unprecedented rates. And we ask, why? Through all this pain, all these stories, <clears throat> there's the pain of individuals, individual communities, individual families, individual people. Where does all the pain come from? It basically comes from stepping outside God's will. <clears throat> the devil doesn't want me to give this talk tonight. <laughs> He's in for a surprise. <clears throat> we might be here for two, three more hours, but I'm giving the doggone talk. <clears throat> a couple of minutes <clears throat> My least favorite thing is what I'm going to do this evening, talk about my own experience. I would rather give a theology lecture. I would rather talk to you about the doctrine of the faith. The last thing in the world I want to do is recount my embarrassing, uh, less than edifying life. I do it quite simply because it has borne fruit in the past. St. Paul said to Timothy, do not be afraid to give testimony, testimony to God. And so we're going to give testimony tonight. We're going to give testimony to God, to his mercy, to his goodness, to the meaning of human existence. Life is worth living. A lot of people don't know that anymore. I told you the other night that suicide is fast becoming the number one cause of death among young people. Now this is a youth-oriented society. Why, if all is well, are our young people killing themselves and each other? Out in California where I live, there's a certain movement an unholy movement among our youth. Suicide is held up as an ideal. The truth has been turned upside down. Doing away with yourself is considered some kind of virtue. The devil has gotten in and the father of lies had done his job. And we better undo his work in a hurry. Young people today have a lot tougher way to go than, than I did when I was young. When I was young, the worst thing you could do was drink beer or get in a fight at a football game. <clears throat> we used to do that regularly. <laughs> but beyond that, there wasn't that much. No drugs. Not that much trouble we really got into. I told you that I have seen 12 and 13 year old children dead in garbage cans. I have. They had been prostitutes already for two years. It doesn't take much of a mathematician to figure out they started real young. Our major cities are crowded with runaways. They run away from home. It must be miserable in their homes. They run away when they're 12 years old, 13 years old. They end up in airports and bus stations. And there are predators waiting for them there. 
They deceive them and seduce them. They ply them with drugs and promises. They end up on the street. And then they end up dead in garbage cans. That's where the devil wants your children and mine. Yeah, I have children too. I have lots of them, thousands. And I love every one of them. And that's why I'm going to tell you this story. I'm going to tell you this story from the heart it's the most personal thing I can share with you. I don't have anything more personal than this that I can share with you because it's my own life. Everybody has their own experience. I have mine. I know that experiences are different. Lives are different. I can only give you mine. It's different. It's unusual. A priest friend of mine Father John Bertolucci, who's a rather well-known preacher, he said this is the most unusual testimony he's ever heard in his life. And he's been around a little bit. Probably a good part of the reason I'm here this week is because I was in Nashville a few years ago. And some of you were there. I gave this testimony then. I still get letters. I, you know, that was a funny thing. I went in there, gave that testimony, and got out. That's all I did. Flew several thousand miles to give that testimony. I never really talked to anybody, didn't hear a thing about it. Two, three, four years later, I started hearing that, oh, Father, I was there that night. That changed my life. That had a profound effect upon me. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad. That's why I'm giving it tonight, and I'm going to keep on giving it till the day I die. We are in an age of darkness. People are losing hope. People are truly losing hope, they're losing confidence, they're discouraged, they're despondent, they're on the edge of despair. Often I've had people and often young people say, why am I alive? What's the meaning of life? You know, by the time we hit 15, we've been there and done that. There isn't anything much left. You know, by the time you've experienced sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and there doesn't seem to be anything else left, you can become very discouraged, very cynical. The world wants to make us cynical. Now, I would have never believed that stuff when I grew up and I got to the age of about 15. I remember that age well. Nothing against people who are 15. That's a wonderful age. But when I hit 15, having accumulated all worldly wisdom, having acquired the knowledge of all things, I was at a point where nobody could tell me anything because if you already know everything, what's to learn? My attitude towards religion started to be slanted. Oh, it didn't always used to be that way. I grew up Catholic. I was baptized when I was 10 days old, went to Catholic school. I had wonderful religious sisters that taught me throughout school, sisters of St. Joseph. One of my earliest experiences that I remember was a religious experience. Funny how you remember little things, you forget a million things, but you remember seemingly insignificant things. One of my first memories is probably when I was about, oh, I don't know how old I was, five, six years old maybe. It was, I know it was in the month of May, for the lilacs were in bloom in upstate New York. And we had gone to church that evening to say the rosary made devotions. My grandmother, my mother, my sister and I. I came home and I went out in the backyard of my grandmother's house. She lived right across the street. And she had a beautiful garden and there were a lot of lilacs. And I was just a little boy, five, six years old, smelling the lilacs out there. And all of a sudden there was a woman in the yard with me. I'll never forget it. She was a beautiful young woman. She smiled at me, and she just said one word, Johnny. He used to call me Johnny in those days. And I was highly embarrassed. And I kind of turned away, and when I turned back, she was gone. I figured she went in the house to visit my grandmother or my Aunt Mary. I never thought another thing about it. But from the earliest years, I do remember something about myself. Maybe you remember this about yourself. I always wanted to be something special. 
Every human being has the seeds of greatness woven into the very fabric of their being. We want to be somebody. We want to be looked up to. We want to be successful. We want our friends to respect us, to love us. We want our family to be proud of us. We want to be something special, whatever form that might take. I always had that sense from the earliest age. In the beginning, I was very shy. I didn't really get along well with people. I was just too shy. And I began with sports. I was pretty good in sports, and I got real good in football. And so I thought, this is the way I can make my mark in the world, and I started to do it. Played varsity football my freshman year in high school. By the next year, uh, we were on our way to the state championship. It looked good, then it got hurt. And I was nobody all over again. See, I had put my hopes in being someone in that business called football. I thought if I could be great in that, then I'll really be great. People look up to me. I'll be successful. That'll be my way. Everybody needs a way to succeed. That was going to be mine. But it collapsed. Made me very sad when it did. But life goes on. Vietnam came along. Some of my friends went. I was in college. And I had stirrings of patriotism. Patriotism isn't a bad thing. It's a virtuous thing. Back in those days, I didn't understand anything about wars, or I just knew my country was in a fight. So being 18 years old and never really running from a fight, I thought, well, I better go fight for my country. So I enlisted in the Green Berets. When I look back on some of the stuff, I can't hardly believe it. What I went through at the age of 18 was quite amazing. Among other things, I remember the night that I jumped out of an airplane. I didn't jump out of the airplane. I was shot out of the bomb chute of a B-52 with compressed air from 20,000 feet, called a halo jump. Everything's dark. You get shot out of that airplane and you fall over 19,000 feet. And you watching, I mean you watching real close. <laughs> a lighted altimeter. And then you pop the chute when you get down to about 800 feet. That's to get under radar. It's an infiltration technique. And then you swim underwater, you land in the water, by the way, in the ocean. And then you swim underwater and you get in that way on scene. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> That's what I was doing when I was 18 years old. And I was on my way to a pretty good military career. I wanted to be there. A lot of people didn't want to be there. They were drafted, I'd enlisted. But then I got hurt again. And then my way to glory collapsed out from underneath me. You see, I had tied success to being something in particular. I didn't understand that human greatness comes with the territory. That the fact that we are created in God's own image and likeness is what makes us great. The fact that you're a person is where your dignity is. It's not in the fact of what you do, that you achieve a certain thing, you make so much money, get a certain stature in the world. No, your greatness is in your personhood. Your dignity is being created in the image and likeness of God. Well, I got out of the Army after sitting behind a desk in Europe for three years, finished college, went into business, went to Las Vegas of all places, and I thought I'd make my mark in business. So. I went to work for a big accounting firm. I was a CPA. Las Vegas Hilton, the Flamingo Hilton, the Tropicana, they were all my clients. It was in the days when Elvis Presley was the big headliner at the Hilton. Frank Sinatra would play at uh, Caesar's Palace. And I used to get comped to all these shows. I had certain power in Las Vegas. I was a rising star in my field. The governor eventually promoted me or put me in the gaming control board. I rubbed elbows with the stars. I liked it. I liked the glitter. I liked the money. I liked the fast lane. I got a taste for it. The governor wasn't reelected then, and so the political appointments went out the door. 
I didn't have a job, so I went to Beverly Hills, California, got into real estate. I heard you can make lots of money in real estate, and that's what I did. I was following my dream. You see, society had convinced me that the American dream, success, money, prestige, power, that was the way to go. If you want to be somebody, you've got to have money. You've got to have a position. You've got to have influence with people. And then you can be somebody. I always want to be somebody. I want people to look at me and say, that is a successful man. That's not a bad thing. I didn't understand, though, that that's not where happiness is to be found. So I pursued it with a vengeance. I pursued the American dream with a vengeance. And I want to tell you something, I caught up with it. After two short years, I was generating with another young man who was only 18 years old when he started. The two of us together were generating approximately 80% of the gross income of the biggest investment real estate company in Los Angeles. Two of us out of 200 agents were generating 80% of the gross income of that company. Didn't take me long to figure out I didn't need that company. I went and found my own. Penthouse Suite in Beverly Hills, 1978. I bought a new Ferrari, 308 GTS, nice shiny red one. And I had mine before Magnum PI had his. <laughs> and I figured I'd arrive. I'd take the top off my Ferrari, I'd put my cowboy hat and my shades on, and I'd drive down Rodeo Drive, and I was cool. And everybody would look, and they would say, that must be somebody, I wonder who that is. And I liked that. I thought that was success. I thought that was the American dream. That went on for some time, until one night I was invited to a party in the Hollywood Hills, Several rock stars, movie stars were there. And a young actress said to me, oh, come with me, I'd like to introduce you to my best friend. And I immediately thought, oh, happy day. Maybe she looks like you. And she took me in another room and she went into her purse and took out a gold vial, opened it up, and there was a white powder in there, and she said, meet my best friend, cocaine. And that began a dance with death that almost did me in. I had about reached the top of my profession. I had a net worth of over $4 million. I was making $800,000, $900,000 in cash a year back then in the 70s. It wasn't the greatest amount of money in the world, but it was pretty good for a, a poor boy from a small town. I began to party more, work less. The predictable happened. Oh, I had rock stars and movie stars from my clients. I ate with them, I drank with them. I got high with them. I sinned with them. I almost died with them. I end up in a hospital. After about two years of it, I ended up in a hospital, a mental hospital, a very scary place to be. I lost everything, including my so-called friends. Interesting, you find out who your friends are when you can't buy them. You find out who your friends are when you don't have something they want. I didn't have very many friends. Matter of fact, I didn't have any. I remember going in that hospital, not a single soul ever visited me. My mother was the only person who ever came to see me. I was there for one full year. You know how long a year is? A year is a very long time when you are in darkness, when you are alone, when you are frightened, when you've been to the top and fallen off the back side of the mountain. A year is a long time to think about your own stupidity, about your own failures. I'd made it on my own, and I blew it on my own. And so I sat in that hospital in agony. Depression is a horrible thing. 
I do not know how many of you are acquainted with that dark specter called depression. That can be a very miserable companion. How many nights I had, get high, the sun starts coming up. What goes up must come down. And I'm going to tell you something, you don't want to come down that way. In the last year I was in Los Angeles, 12 of my friends and acquaintances died. Eight of them from suicide, four of them heart attacks induced by cocaine. They're all young, they were all intelligent, music producers, actors, musicians, a physician, a pro football player, with everything to live for. Dead. Dead. I remember every one of them. I remember every one of them and how they died and when they died and the circumstances in which they died. Tragedy beyond imagination. It's been compounding ever since then. I sat in that hospital, depressed and then anxious. It's a terrible pendulum. I would go from deep depression to a kind of anxiety which is called a panic attack. I don't know if you know what panic attacks are. Very painful. And so I'd have those panic attacks and then I'd sink into that deep depression and I w it was torture. I wanted to die. For three years of my life I wanted to die but couldn't. I never attempted suicide but I wanted to die. I just didn't believe I could go on another minute. Now maybe some of you have been there. I hope not, and I hope you never are if you haven't. But maybe some of you, even some of the young people, maybe you've had a dim intimation of that. Maybe you've tasted that a little bit at times. Maybe you wonder, how can I ever get out of this? Will it ever change? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. I'm here to tell you that no matter how bad it is, it can get better. When I was in the middle of it, I couldn't see that. I was tortured. I remember the worst point. I had no friends, I had no money, I had nothing to come out to. And at a certain point in time, they brought me into a, an examination room and they put me down on a table. And I was waiting for a doctor and I was just looking up at the ceiling and I remember thinking, how could I be here, me? How could I be here? I never got in any trouble when I was a kid. I wasn't some gang member. I, I wasn't violent. I'm a successful man. I made it big. What am I doing here? How could I be here? And I was crying. I was in agony. At that point, the door opened. And a woman came in, a young woman dressed in a nurse's uniform. She was vaguely familiar. And she just looked at me, and she smiled, and she said, Johnny. And she went out, and I didn't think anything of it, and I had an odd sensation of the scent of lilacs, but I thought for sure she has lilac perfume on or something. I never thought a thing about it. She went out. Well, I got out of that hospital sometime later, but I had no place to go. See, I'd lost everything, everything. I went onto the street. You probably have street people in Memphis. You know, most big cities have people that live on the street. They make us kind of uncomfortable. We don't really like to get too close to them. Maybe we even cross the street if they're coming down on our side. They might ask us for something, you know, hit us up for some money, panhandle. I was one of those people. Oh, I never panhandled. I was too embarrassed. I was too embarrassed to even go to the soup kitchen and eat. I used to sit on the same park bench that I had sat on when I was a successful businessman. It somehow helped me to sit in that park. I used to like to watch the ducks fly in and out of the pond. It soothed me a little bit. I'd sit on that bench all night. I had no place to go. I had the clothes on my back, I had no money, I had no food, I had no friends. 
That's one thing when you're used to that. It's another thing when you grew up a normal kid, became wealthy, and then became destitute. That's a radical change. It was traumatic to say the least. I was in agony. I didn't know what day I would die, maybe the next day. I remember at a certain point, a friend tracked me down and gave me a letter from my mother. I'm going to tell you something, moms, grandmas, I'm talking to you right here. This is a story about a mother's love. This is a story about darkness that can be pierced by that light called mom or dad. This is a story about evil being overcome by good. A story about lies being overcome by the truth. A letter came from my mother and she said, son, I know you're in big trouble. Why don't you come home? Why don't you give up? Get out of the street. It's dangerous. You can come home. I'll give you a safe place. You can think. You can get your life together. You got to swallow a lot of pride when you grow up dirt poor, become greatly wealthy, and then lose it because of your own stupidity to go home to my little old hometown, to my mother's little house. A loser. At the age of 37, I couldn't face it. And I resisted it. And in that letter, she said, look, you've tried everything else. Why don't you try saying a prayer? And she put a little holy card of the Blessed Mother in there. It's a picture of Our Lady. On the back of it was the Hail Mary. And it said, say one Hail Mary a day. The mom said, look, you've tried it all. Try this. What could it hurt? And I had tried it all. And I did say, well, what could it hurt? And so I began to say one Hail Mary a day out there in the street. Now, I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic schools. I did not remember how to say a Hail Mary. I'm telling you, I couldn't remember how to say a Hail Mary. I had to read it off that holy card. I'd look at the picture of the Blessed Mother. I'd turn it over, and I'd say that prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace. I'd read it off of there one time. I wasn't going to become no religious fanatic. <laughs> one time and one time only. And I did that every day for some time. Another letter got delivered to me. My mother said, come on home. I'll send you a ticket. <laughs> Mom didn't send me no money. Mom sent me one-way ticket from Los Angeles to Albany, New York. Well, I took it. I went home. I had been in misery for years, and then the misery got worse. I got home, came into that house where I grew up. Now, we grew up in, I guess you could call it a ghetto, projects or whatever, poor area, in a relatively small town. It wasn't a big city kind of a ghetto, but it, it was poor. Uh, I grew up that way. I never knew. We didn't know we were poor because we had food, we had clothing, we had a house to live in. But going back there, after having been out in sunny California, owning several houses, my main house was in Channel Islands Harbor, north of Los Angeles, 6,000 square feet, solid oak on the inside. I had four balconies. I had a 60-foot boat dock with my own Hatteras yacht parked at it, a Ferrari in one garage and a Cadillac in the other one. I'd look out from my decks or my balconies on the water. Now I went home, and I looked out at those run-down tenement buildings, and I got real depressed. It closed in on me. The devil began to tempt me again. Just kill yourself and get it over with. Thirty days came and went. I had been saying that one Hail Mary, and that one Hail Mary then went to the rosary. I began to say the rosary. And then I began to read the Bible because the rosary is the prayer of the Gospels. And it led me into the scriptures. I began to read the scriptures. But I was still in agony even though I was trying. June 23rd, 1984, I remember it so well because all the temptations of a lifetime were distilled, synthesized, and presented to me. I was sick of sin. For years, I had prayed for God to deliver me. I hadn't forgotten to pray, but I hadn't lived a good life. 
I remember running around the grounds, jogging on that hospital. It was a VA hospital. I remember at night falling down on my knees outside in the midst of jogging, begging God to save me, begging him to intervene in my life. Nothing happened. I prayed and I prayed, nothing happened. You know why nothing happened? Because I wasn't ready to give up sin. I didn't know it at the time, but I just wasn't ready in my heart to give up sin. Well, that one day, June 23rd, 1984, all the temptations pressed down on me. Temptations against purity. Temptations to drugs. I resisted it. I was so sick of sin that I just didn't want to do it anymore. But I thought at any moment I'd collapse. And the devil was telling me, look, I can keep this up forever. I can put the pressure on you, and you're gonna, you know you're going to give in. Well, I didn't know any different because I always had. I really didn't realize God was stronger. And so I half believed it, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't give in. That night, I knelt down before I went to bed. And from my heart, I was sincere. I guess I'd been broken enough, battered enough, crushed enough. I hit bottom. And I begged God, if you are real, and I don't know if you are or not, you got to save me and you better do it now because I don't think I can live another day. I lay down and I cannot describe to you what really happened. I did not have any visions. I did not hear any voices. But I went into a deep, beautiful peace. I couldn't move. It was that peace which surpasses all understanding. It was that peace which was so deep, I physically couldn't move. I was like this, laying down on my bed. I couldn't move. Eight hours went by. I couldn't twitch a muscle. I didn't want to. It was very beautiful. In that deep peace, something went on. In the morning, I was released from that. I sat up in my bed and I cried. And I cried and I had what I believe we call perfect contrition. I was sorry for my sins from the heart because of love of God, because I'd offended him. There wasn't the question of fear of hell in that I had an understanding of God. He put it in my heart. I didn't read it in a book. No preacher came and told me about it. I didn't get it in a catechism lesson. Somehow, in a mysterious way, the Holy Spirit had reached down into my heart and he put something there. You know what he put in my heart? He put God's name in my heart. He put God's holy name in my heart so that I knew him from the inside out. God's name is mercy. God's name is mercy. And I knew that God was not some abstraction out there somewhere. It's hard to love an abstraction. I knew that God is personal. I knew that he loved me and that he wanted a relationship with me. I knew that he was calling me to intimacy with himself. In a flash of light, in an instant, in a 10 second period, I knew all that. I knew it intuitively. It had been put in my heart, infused. And I'll tell you what else I knew. I knew I was called to be a priest. I went to my mother. I got up. Now you gotta, you gotta really grasp this. <laughs> 20 years had come and gone. I've been out of the church 20 years. When I was about 15, I started sneaking off Sunday morning to the pool hall. I didn't go to mass. I told my mom, oh, I'm going to the 9 o'clock mass or the 10 o'clock mass. She went to another one. <clears throat> I didn't go to mass. I snuck off and shot pool with the boys and went downhill from there. 20 years I was outside the church. 20 years I didn't receive the sacraments. 20 years I didn't set foot in a Catholic church. And now I'm getting up this morning, June 24th, 1984. And I casually go up to my mama and I said, now you mothers, you try to get this. I go up to my mother and I casually announce, mama, I think I'd like to go to confession. Now this woman been praying on her knees for 20 years for this day. And she, as nonchalantly as she could, said, oh. 
And she kind of swayed in her place, like, you know, like she might, might, might fall over any minute, but, oh, well, that's nice, son. That's good. I said, yeah, but I don't want to go around here. <laughs> oh, no. I ain't going to confession over there to the regular priest in our parish. Oh, no. I want to go someplace special. I was a big time sinner. I got to go someplace special for this first confession. And so my mother, having the wisdom of mothers, said, all right, son, good. I know just the place. I'll take you. So we went up to a place about an hour and a half from my hometown called the, Sh the Shrine of the North American Martyrs in Orysville, New York. My family had gone there every year oh, for generations. It is the place where St. René Goupil, St. Isaac Joel, they were martyred there. It is the birthplace of Blessed Kateri Tekakwitha. And so my mother drove us up there. I remember getting out of the car. I was scared to death. Anybody in here who hasn't been to confession for a while, don't be scared. I was scared, but don't you be scared. I'll tell you something. Go through with it and get it over with. Well, I, I was, we, we walked on the grounds, and I was looking for a priest, half hoping I wouldn't find one. And, and sure enough, here comes one. And I got up my courage. I could hardly talk. I was so nervous. And I said, uh, Father, I'd like to go to confession. And he said, oh, well, he said, I'm rushing to go say mass. I can't hear your confession right now. And I kind of breathe the sigh of release. He said, but right down there is an elderly priest in a rocking chair on the front porch of the office. Now you go down there, and he'll hear your confession. I said, OK. So I walk down there, and, and this is, you know, the martyr shrine is all log buildings. You know, the, the buildings are, are built out of the native logs, um, like pioneer type days. So I went down, sure enough, in a rocking chair was an old priest. I mean, he was an old priest. Uh, this priest was so old, I wasn't sure if he was alive or dead. But I, he was sitting in a rocking chair, and he was saying rosary. And, and that was a sign to me, because I'd been saying rosary. So I kind of took comfort in that. I saw that rosary, and, and I received something from that, a kind of consolation, a boost from my courage. And I went up to him, and I said, Father, uh, could you hear my confession? And he smiled at me. He was a very kind man. And he said, of course. And so I knelt down right next to his rocking chair. And I said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 20 years since my last confession. And I made a good confession. I had the grace to pour it all out. He raised his hand. He said, I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then he looked at his watch. He said, amazing, amazing. So, something magnificent's going on here beyond the confession. Look here, it's exactly 3 p.m. Exactly 3 p.m., the hour when Jesus died on the cross for you, the hour of mercy. It's a magnificent moment, and there's something more. I don't know what it is, but I sense something real special. And I said, oh, Father, I know what it is. I know what it is. He said, well, tell me. I said, Father, I'm called to be a priest. Now look, this man had just heard that confession. And there wasn't anything left out of it. You name it, I had done it. Now the poor man, I thought he might have had brain damage from listening to all that. And he kind of swayed in his rocking chair. And he said, well, all things are possible with God. Well, that began a journey. That began a tremendous journey towards my vocation. I had never been certain that I was where I was supposed to be. I began looking here, there, and everywhere to see where I would fit in. I knew in my heart I was called to be a priest. It wasn't easy. I went many places, and I didn't fit. I wasn't wanted in those places. I didn't fit in those places. But finally, I found the right place. I went to the seminary. I was terribly sick in the seminary most of the time from the day I arrived. I was sick as a dog, three quarters of the time, and it looked like I would flunk out. I had to work because I didn't really have enough money, so I had to work as well as go to school. I remember when I, that first semester, it was hot. I went to a seminary in a valley in Connecticut. It was hot and it was humid, and I'd work up on a roof painting. And I was in my little room, and I was sick to death with a migraine headache, which I had about five days out of seven the entire time 
that I was in the seminary and all through my advanced education. And it looked like I would flunk out because I couldn't make it to a lot of the classes. And I remember praying, I was crying, is what I was doing. I had come this far to fail. I couldn't face that reality. And I was just crying out to God, well, if this, if this isn't my vocation, then what is? What is my vocation? Now, I'll tell you something, at this point, I don't normally tell people. This is not a normal part of this testimony. I leave this out. At that moment, I had a strange experience. The voice of Archbishop Fulton Sheen came out of nowhere. It echoed in my soul, and it said, your vocation is to deliver children in the name of truth. And that struck me, because I recognized those words. In philosophy, we had studied Socrates, and they couldn't figure out what Socrates was all about. He was different. He was a philosopher, but very different. And they would ask Socrates, well, what exactly are you? And Socrates would say, I am like my mother. Socrates' mother was a midwife. He said, but I deliver children in the name of truth. And those words echoed in the center of my soul. And why Archbishop Fulton Sheen, I don't have a clue, but that's what happened. And from that moment, I was confirmed in my vocation. I went through the seminary and I graduated with the highest academic average in the history of that seminary. And I couldn't go to half the classes. I was too sick. And then they sent me to Europe. And I studied, and I got three more degrees, a bachelor, a licentiate, and a doctorate in sacred theology, graduating summa cum laude and everything. Highest honors. Why? Because I'm smart? No. Because God knows what he's doing. I didn't know what I was doing. If God gives you a mission, God provides the grace. And sometimes he stoops down to the bottom of the barrel. I tell you this, Our Lady was scouring the gutters for the lowest one she could find. And she found me down there in a the gutter and she picked me up. And so I ended up in this pontifical university in Spain. And while I was there, I went as a deacon. I thought, God wants me to be ordained a priest by the Pope. And so I requested it. And the request was approved. And in May of 1991, I found myself on a bus to Italy. And then on May 26th, Trinity Sunday, I found myself with 61 other men processing up the center aisle of St. Peter's Basilica. At the end of the procession was Pope John Paul II. We got to our places. I turned around 10 feet from me was Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Mother Teresa was behind me. The Pope was in front of me. At that moment, I thought, I'm in a pretty good place. <laughs> and for three hours, the beautiful liturgy of ordination of the Roman Catholic Church unfolded. When my turn came, I walked up to the main altar. I knelt before the Holy Father, the successor of St. Peter, the Vicar of Christ. His hands came down upon my head. And I remembered, I remembered where I had been, I've been through the darkness. I've been through the darkest night. I've been through a dangerous place. Many times over, I should have been dead. I made mistake after mistake and committed sin after sin. I lived in a living hell. But God's name is mercy. He put it all aside. I remember the words, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow, washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so the Holy Father ordained me a priest. After the ceremony, we were processing out three choirs singing beautiful, beautifully. 10,000 people were there. 10,000 people were at that ordination. And as we were processing out, I would say I was more floating than walking. And I caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye. We had just passed several of the cardinals and bishops in the front rows. And out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a woman. A vaguely familiar woman, beautiful young woman. And she smiled. 
a beautiful smile at me, and I saw her lips move. She said my name, that name that I had heard almost 40 years before that for the first time. That day, there were three mothers at St. Peter's. My own mother, Veronica, who had prayed for me for 20 years, day and night, never gave up. You mothers, you grandmothers, you fathers, grandfathers, you remember that. You may have children that are in trouble. You may have children struggling. Never give up on your children. God didn't finish with them yet. God didn't finish with them yet. I remember days when I would, they would spit on me in the street. Down and out. That's what the devil said. You down, you out. No, God said, you may be down, boy, but you're not out. I'm not finished with you yet. God's not finished with any of us yet. And so, processing out that beautiful woman. Three mothers were there. My mother, my holy mother of the church, and I believe my blessed mother. She had never given up on me, just as my natural mother had never given up on me. My Holy Mother, the Church, never gave up on me either. For the Church prays for sinners. The Church prays for her own. The Church doesn't give up. The Church fights on for souls. And so, my brothers and sisters, this is a story of hope. This is a story, as I told you yesterday, you know, when that, when that big man came up to me in the prison, shaking his head after I told this story. And he said, boy, Father, if God can forgive you, I know I'm in good shape. <laughs> you all remember that. Whether you're young or old, no matter what you do or fail to do, if you mess up, get up. Don't let anybody convince you you're finished. God can do great things through you. He took me through his mother's work. He picked me up, he wiped me off, and now unworthy as I am, he uses me. Our tapes go all over the world. This talk, over 100,000 copies of it have gone out in the last two years alone, and we don't even know how many of them get pirated. People copy them and we're, we don't mind. Let them pass them out to everybody you know. You know, the tapes are all over Northern Ireland, I found out this year. Those tapes are all over Northern Ireland. I've never been in Northern Ireland. We never sold a tape in Northern Ireland, ever. A lady got arrested in Saudi Arabia last summer for smuggling 500 of my tapes into Saudi Arabia. You know, that, that's a, uh, an Islamic country. You don't want to be smuggling in no Catholic tapes in Saudi Arabia. That lady got arrested. Well, they let her off with a $10,000 fine. She went back six months later with 500 more tapes. She didn't get caught that time. God will do great things for you. Don't you lay down and quit on Jesus. If there's somebody here who's struggling, if you've been caught in the snares of drugs or alcohol, if you've let yourself down through promiscuity, and the devil tells you, well, you're mine now anyway, you've lost your virginity, don't you listen to that garbage. Jesus, who created everything out of nothing, can renew something out of something. He can take you and make you just as pure as the day you were baptized. You believe that. You hold on to that. This is a story of truth. This is a story of God's mercy. And his mercy endures forever. God bless you. None of those who cry out, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Sobering words. Crying out, Lord, Lord, isn't enough. Saying Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior isn't enough. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's very good. But it isn't enough for the simple reason talk is cheap. 
action costs something. It's not easy to fight the good fight and run the race to the finish line. We can say we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. We can say we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. And we've got to say it. We've got to confess our faith. But then we have to put our life where our words are. You've got to live it out. That takes a lifetime of struggle, of decisions, the right decisions. Anyone who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on rock. Your house is your life. All you have is this one life. All I have is this one life God has given to us as a gift, the gift of time, the gift of our being. What are you going to do with that life? That house, that edifice, that temple you're building for the Lord, what are you building it on? I built a house this past spring, a small one, a hermitage, a cabin in the woods. It's no big deal, but I learned a lot. I never did that before. And I had a very experienced man who was doing most of the work. And the most important thing is what you build that house on. If you don't build that house on a solid foundation, not going to last long. If you don't build the edifice of your life on a solid foundation, storms will come. Temptations will come. Will your house, will your life stand fast with the onslaught of those storms? The winds will blow. The rains will lash out against your house. Is your house going to stand fast under all that? If it is built on solid rock, it's going to stand fast. But if you build it on sand, erosion takes place. If you build your life on false teachings, erroneous ideas, if you build your life on a set of lies rather than the rock-solid truth, then the winds and storms and rains of time will come. Erosion will set in. Your house, the foundation of that house, will be undermined, and you'll be swept away. The world is lying to us. The spirit of the world is at work. And you know who the prince of this world is? The devil. The one Jesus said he is a liar and the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. He is the one holding sway in the world. That worldly spirit which says whatever you want to do is okay. I'm okay. You're okay. Well, on a certain level, yes. God loves you. God loves me. We're okay in that sense. Our being is good. God created us, he created us good. Yes, amen to that. But you're a sinner, and so am I. And we have to acknowledge that reality. The truth is a rock. Don't build your house on a rock with holes in it. Don't build your house on shale. Don't build your house on sand. Don't build your house on part of the rock. You've got to have solid rock, and that means the full gospel. That means all the teaching of Jesus Christ, not some of it. Don't leave out the parts that are inconvenient. Don't leave out the hard parts that are difficult to square with a 90s lifestyle, especially a decadent 90s lifestyle. You've got to take the fullness of God's truth. He revealed himself to us in the person of his only son, Jesus Christ. He's the only teacher. The teaching of Christ is the teaching of the church. Accept all of Jesus. Don't say, I take part of you, but I don't want that part. Don't try to rationalize morality away. Don't say, God doesn't care about morality. You didn't never read the Bible to say something like that, or you're reading it with a rationalistic, subjectivist, idealist mentality, which is filled with lies that lead to death. The church's teaching is truth. 
That is a rock. All through the Old Testament, whenever you see the word rock, capital R, it refers to God. Then in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus changes Simon's name to rock. Peter, thou art rock. And upon this rock I will build my church. In the very gates of hell, the jaws of death will not prevail against it. Jesus is grafting Peter into himself. He's not making Peter God. Peter isn't God. He's a man. The Pope isn't God. He's a man. But he's not just any man. And whenever you hear that, oh, he's just another man with his opinion, go the other way. Because that's a lie. He's not just any man. He is a man. But Jesus grafted that man into himself. Thou art rock. Jesus is the rock. Jesus alone is the chief cornerstone upon which the edifice of the church is built. Jesus is the rock upon which we build our life. But he has grafted Peter into himself and proclaimed, whatever you hold bound on earth will be held bound in heaven. Whatever you hold loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's given him power, and it's the power of God. No man has the power to forgive sins. No man can make up the truth. The truth is eternal because the truth is God. The truth is immutable and unchangeable because the truth in its essence is God himself. As the letter to the Hebrews says, Jesus Christ, who is the truth, who is the rock, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. Build your house, build your life on the rock-solid foundation of the doctrine of the faith. Real teaching, the teaching of our church, the teaching of Jesus Christ. You're wise if you do that. You are not wise if you build the edifice of your life on a foundation of sand. What is sand? Sand isn't solid. Sand is always shifting. Shifting this way, shifting that way. That's personal opinion. That's the mere personal opinion of men. Jesus never intended that eternal truth be determined by a democratic vote. I don't care how many percentage of Christians say Jesus isn't there really in the Eucharist. I don't care if 95%, 99% say that. That doesn't establish the truth. That just confirms that 99% done lost their faith. Simple as that. When the rainy season came, you know what the rainy season is? Right now. This is the rainy season. The rainy season means a time of storm and strife, a time when your faith is attacked from without and from within. The world attacks our faith, says that we, we don't have a faith that makes any sense. The Eucharist is the source, the center, and the summit of our Christian faith. That's what the church teaches. That's right out of the Second Vatican Council. We've always believed it. We believe it now, and we will believe it until time breathes forth its last moment. Jesus in the Eucharist is the source, center, and summit of our Christian life. Now look here. If you don't have the source, and you don't have the center, and you don't have the summit, what do you have? You have something with a lot of holes in it. It's not solid. God gave us himself as the greatest gift he could possibly give. The storms have come. We are in the midst of stormy times. The pagan and neo-pagan world is attacking us, attacking our values, our beloved country, this great country, which we love, I know, we do, this great country has made a shambles of the Christian values upon which it was established. The founders of this country were Christians. And they made the, the statement that this form of government will not work unless it is based upon Christian principles. If Christian ideals go by the wayside, the founding fathers of this country, I'm not talking about ministers and priests, I'm talking about Adams. I'm talking about people that founded this country, it won't work, they said, if Christian values go out the window. And so we have over three million babies killed in their mother's wombs 
and it's legal. We have now euthanasia legal in the state of Oregon. Other states will follow. We have the most outlandish immorality legalized in the name of a specious notion of freedom, which isn't freedom at all, it's license. And if you get that one wrong, you're headed for slavery. We got it wrong. Freedom is the power to do what you ought to do. It's not doing whatever you want to do. Because that notion of freedom leads to a breakdown of morality. If I can do whatever I want to do, this is a free country. I can do what I want to do. If I want to be immoral with your 12-year-old child, I can do it because I'm free. Baloney. That's not freedom. That's license. Freedom is power to live the way you ought to live. You need power to live the way you ought to do. What should we do? What's the highest thing? To love God, to know God, and to serve God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. You need power to do that. You're not going to do it if you don't have power. You don't have that power, you're not free. How do you lose that power? Sin. Sin. Jesus said it. The man who sins becomes the slave of sin. And so build your house on solid rock. Otherwise, it's going to collapse. If you build your house on the whims and passing fancies of any man, any generation, any philosophy, that's sand. It's here one day, gone the next. You know, one philosopher, he holds sway for a little while, then another one, shifting sand. Personal opinion. Hey, take a Gallup poll 30 years ago, and the people said one thing. Take another one today, they say another thing. That's sand shifting here and there. You want to build your house on that? You're headed for a fall. Your house is going to collapse when your life comes under attack. Anyone who hears my words and puts them into effect is wise. Now, what's the Word of God? Well, we know the Word of God. It's in the Bible. In the Catholic Church, we have the sacred scriptures, we have sacred tradition, we have magisterial teaching which authentically and authoritatively interprets the Word of God, whether written, the Bible, or handed on orally, sacred tradition, the apostolic kerygma. I'm going to tell you one of the most important dimensions of the Word of God. This is truth. This is the Word of God. This is the sixth chapter of the Gospel of St. John. Enormously important. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. A lot of people are starving to death today. A lot of people are very hungry today. A lot of people are very empty today. They are searching. They are lost. They look in here. They look in there. They look in everywhere for an answer. They're starving. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and he who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The Jews began to murmur, because he said, I am the bread of life who has come down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus? We know him, son of the carpenter. Jesus answered them, don't murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then a little while later, he says, your fathers ate manna in the desert, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread. Jesus is talking. God and Son of God is talking here. I am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, I'm going to give you a very short, concise lesson in Scripture. You can take the Bible, you can read it, and if you interpret it subjectively, you can come up with anything you want. 
Because if you have a million people reading any passage of any book, including the Bible, they will interpret it according to their own filter. We all have a filter. The filter is the sum total of our education, our experience, everything in our life. Everything we take in comes through that filter, that intelligence, that experience. I'm t the problem is very few people check their filter. <laughs> you see, so you, you can read the Word of God and, and you can say, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't mean what the Catholics think it means. It means this, or it means it's just a merely spiritual thing. It doesn't have anything to do with the Eucharist. A lot of people think that. I respect what anybody thinks. Everybody has the right to think whatever they want and believe whatever they want, and they must be left free. And I totally respect what anybody believes. I'm just talking to Catholics. I, I don't preach to anybody else. I preach to Catholics. This is what the Catholic Church believes. How do we read the Bible? There are three principles which you must apply in reading the Bible. Number one, you have to read it as a totality. You cannot take it out of context. I'll give you an example. When I was down in Florida a few years ago preaching, there was a certain minister down there who was preaching that we've got to kill abortion doctors. We've got to kill them because they are a threat to those innocent little babies. And he used the Bible. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and you kill my brother and I'll kill yours. He was preaching that publicly. We, when I, I was there, and a friend of mine was the director of the pro-life office in the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. And he tried to, this was public, it was on television. So this priest, friend of mine, he went on television. And he said, this is not what the Bible is saying. We can't do this. And he tried to bring about a reasoned approach to this and show, well, you know what happened, don't you? You know what happened a short time after that? It started happening. Two doctors were killed in Pensacola, abortion doctors. What you don't know is that death threats came into the Chancery office and they said, for every one of them you kill, we're going to murder ten priests. And the police said it was serious. And priests had to start using anti-terrorist tactics, leaving their rectory. You couldn't go the same way to and from the rectory. You had to be very careful. They wanted us to go in twos wherever we went any place. Why? Because that man didn't know how to read the Bible, and he fostered that kind of error. You've got to read the Bible as a totality. You don't take it out of context, because you can justify anything and everything if you do. Number two, you have to read the Word of God, that truth, that rock, in the light of sacred tradition. You know what sacred tradition is? Sacred tradition is the teaching of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus himself, when he was on the earth, didn't write a book. Now the Bible has God as its primary author, no question about that. But Jesus taught orally. He taught his apostles, and his apostles handed on his teaching faithfully. That's called the apostolic kerygma, sacred tradition. That's the teaching of the church in faith and morals. Some of that then was recorded in writing. Some of that was recorded in writing. That's called the Bible. You must read the Bible in the light of sacred tradition. And third, you must apply what we call the analogy of the faith. An example of that, you pick up the Bible, you read it, and, and through a, a kind of scientific methodology. I don't know if you ever heard about this, but there's a lot of science is good. We use it in biblical studies. The Germans were very strong in theology and Bible studies. We call it form criticism. You, you take, for instance, a, a letter. It might have um, uh, a literary form of uh, apocalyptic literature. And you, you, there's a German word. It's, it's called Formgeschichte. And then there's another one called redaction geschichte. You got all this geschichte. We got too much geschichte. I'm telling you, they're, they're reading this stuff and they're losing the meaning of it. And some of these scholars are reading the Bible and say, oh, well, Jesus didn't intend to establish a church. You're not applying the analogy of the faith when you come to conclusions like that. 
You've got to know how to read it. Read it as the church reads it. You're not going to come up with any unique and novel interpretations of it because it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hold fast to it. Now, part of this word is the Eucharist. Part of this word is Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Now, the church at the time, his own people, the leaders of the church, they disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? My grandmother used to say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. They're saying it today. How can this be? Now, how can the Eucharist be, in fact, the body and blood of Christ? It's nothing new. They were saying it when Jesus was still on the earth. How, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats my flesh will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ. This is the truth. This is a rock. And you better build your house on this rock because I'm telling you, the world and even factions inside the church are trying to steal your faith. They're trying to convince you through a rationalist, subjectivist, idealist, teaching that it's not really Jesus. We've got heresies rampant from one end of the church to the other, and most people sit back and let it happen. I'm going to tell you something. You sit back and let it happen long enough, you're going to wake up one morning and discover your faith has left. It's nowhere to be found. You better start standing up for the truth, people of God, because if you don't, it's going to be snatched away from you, and you're going to fulfill the words of that author, T.S. Eliot, who prophesied in a way that we may just end not with a bang, but with a whimper. It's happened before in history. Back in the fourth century, the early fifth century, they woke up one morning to find out the whole world was Arian. Arianism was a heresy. They didn't believe Jesus is divine. There is an attack on the Eucharist. And so a little review on the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the source, the center, the summit of our faith. You can't do without it. You go back to the Old Testament to begin to get insight. The people of God were enslaved to Pharaoh. They had been taken away from Israel. They were in Egypt. And then God raised up Moses great leader, prophet. And after they'd suffered for a very long time, Moses was told by God, tell the people, tell every family to get a lamb, an unblemished lamb, a male lamb. And then on this night, I want that lamb to be sacrificed. And you tell the people to take the blood of the lamb and you put it on the lintels in the doorposts of their homes. And that night, I'm going to send forth my angel and the angel is going to strike down every firstborn in the land of man and beast alike. But your house will be protected by the blood of that sacrificial lamb. And the angel will pass over. That's the Passover, the Jewish Passover. That's the Passover. The blood of the lamb will protect your house. And so it happened. On that night, the destroying angel came over Egypt and struck down the firstborn of every man, of all the flocks, and there was great wailing in Egypt. And we know that the chosen people then exited the exodus from Egypt. Now that is what's called a biblical type. It foreshadows something that takes place in the New Testament. Jesus is the Lamb of God. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son 
born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. And so Jesus was born to die. Jesus assumed a human nature, became like one of us in everything except sin. Why? Because we were enslaved. The chosen people were enslaved to Pharaoh. But God wills freedom for his people. And so just as God raised up a mighty hero in Moses, Moses was just a prefigurement in the type of Jesus, the quintessential hero, the consummate hero, the greatest hero who ever lived. And Jesus became man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, filled with grace and truth. And what did he do? He went forth and he healed the sick. There's only one Jesus. The Jesus from all eternity, the eternal Word, the Father's only Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, in the fullness of time, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he took on a human nature became like one of us in every way except sin. He took that human nature then. He walked in Palestine, the same Jesus, the same subject of action who's divine. It's a divine subject of action, a divine person. He walked about Palestine. He delivered those in the grip of the devil. He healed those who were sick. He gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. That's what he did when he walked the face of the earth. Now, nothing's changed. He's still doing it. I have, believe it or not, through the power of God, given sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. I've even raised the dead. Every priest in this sanctuary has raised the dead. You didn't know that, did you? You didn't know you had such famous priests, such great priests in your, in your midst. There isn't a priest I know who hasn't raised the dead. I'm going to tell you something. Every sick man Jesus healed died. And every dead man Jesus raised died eventually. But there's a different kind of healing and a different kind of deliverance and a different kind of raising the dead going on here. These priests hear confessions. Dead men walk into their confessionals and living ones walk out. That's Jesus at work today. We've got to be in touch with these realities. We've got to remind ourselves and not be sidetracked and distracted. The Eucharist, it's Jesus, the same Jesus who walked in Palestine. What did he do? He took that human nature and he brought it to a cross. He suffered and he died and he rose again. That's what's called the Paschal Mystery. The Passion, Death, and Resurrection of the Lord. That's the Paschal Mystery. You know that word, Paschal. The Paschal Lamb from the Passover that I just talked about. The Eucharist is our Passover. The Eucharist is our protection. The Eucharist is the blood of the Lamb. Make sure your house, which is built on solid rock, is anointed with the blood. Don't complain when the devil gets a hold on you if you are not anointed with the blood. If the blood of the Lamb is not marking the doorposts of your house. The Eucharist is the answer. If you're in trouble, the Eucharist is the answer. You on drugs? The Eucharist is the answer. You alcoholic? The Eucharist is the answer. Your family falling apart? The Eucharist is the answer. We got abortion in this country. Babies being murdered. The Eucharist is the answer. Get the people in their prayers. We have the answer to every problem. We have the all holy name of Jesus to strike down evil. We have Jesus himself in the most humble Catholic church any place in the world. That is not bread. That is not a mere sign or symbol. That is the Lord, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He's there. Where are we? We lament this curse of abortion. We lament euthanasia. We lament impurity all over the place. All these evils, violence proliferating in our society, the very fabric of this society unraveling. We're sad about that. We complain about that. 
Jesus is there alone in the tabernacle. Let me tell you something. I've made holy hours all over the world, and I never once had a fight for a front row seat to adore Jesus. Never. And you've got to ask yourself, why is that? This great mystery, this great power, this great gift that God has given to us, why is it that we are so thick-headed, that we are so hard-hearted and stiff-necked, that we will not go before the Lord and take him these troubles. I'm going to tell you something. When enough of us start living our faith the way he intends that we do it, when in fact we make him the source, the center, and the summit of our life, when we begin to do that in great enough numbers, I tell you, the devil's going to turn tail and run. He don't have a chance. That abortion clinic is going to shut down. Now, I have a friend from Wichita, Kansas, a lady just like a lot of you ladies here. She used to go and pray the rosary at the abortion clinics. Now, Wichita was a capital for abortion. I mean, that's a bad place. They put people in jail in Wichita and throw the key away for standing there praying the rosary. They had no effect at all for years. And she didn't know why. And she prayed all night one time. And the Lord said to her, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? You have me in the Eucharist, and what are you doing? Are you bringing this power to bear against that evil? What you need to do is you need to expose the blessed sacrament in the churches. You need to get my people down on their face adoring me and offering reparation. You need to pray my mother's rosary 24 hours a day, and you all need to fast. And if you do that, you watch what happens. Two women did it, only two. They fasted for 40 days on bread and water, and they spent several hours a day in the one chapel that had perpetual adoration. I understand you have one around here. One's enough. <laughs> I bet you there's room there. You all try to go over there, I bet you get a seat. I'll bet you have a place to adore the Lord. All right, you got to start. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. You got to get up and you got to fight. You've got to want the victory. Now, the victory is ours. Jesus won the victory on the cross, He did the hard part. We have to accept the victory. How do we do it? We go and we worship Him. We adore Him. We give Him the gift of time that He's given us. This lady, her name is Celia Chin told me that in a very short time, the first abortion clinic shut down, mysteriously. And they got more people doing this. She has opened, I forget the number now, but I think it's 39 chapels of perpetual adoration. Kansas has a lot of chapels of perpetual adoration relative to the number of Catholics there. Abortion clinics started to close. Oh, there's still some there. But they began to close. They had no success. For many years, they began to do that. They started to apply power. Listen, spiritual problems require spiritual solutions. The Eucharist is God himself. You can't get anything more powerful than that. I'm going to tell you, though, what the devil's doing. He's very clever. The devil gets himself into positions of authority. He gets himself into institutions of higher learning. He gets himself into places that insist on calling themselves Catholic universities, colleges, and seminaries. And then the devil starts teaching, and he starts teaching garbage. And what he starts teaching is, well, it's just a symbol. It's just a sign. Nothing really changes. You don't want to use words like transubstantiation. There's really the bread and the presence. Or maybe it's just the presence while you're having mass, but then there isn't any more presence. You've got a bunch of nonsense going on. This has been taught. This has been taught to seminarians and people in Catholic universities. It's more mysterious than the mystery of iniquity itself, how that can have gone on. But it has. You be clear. Don't you take any watered-down, falsified, distorted teaching. The Eucharist is Jesus, and nothing less than that. At Holy Mass, this is the sacrifice, the very same sacrifice of Calvary. You say, how can that be? 
I say it is a theandric action. That means that divine person, Jesus Christ, through his human nature, that's what theandric means. It means an action of the God-man. Jesus, the Son of God, divine, through his human nature, at the Last Supper instituted the Eucharist. He instituted that in anticipation of Calvary the next day. Every time we celebrate Mass, we enter into something transcendent. Because it is an action of the God-man, it transcends time and space. And so at any time and in any place, we can enter into that and make it present. The Mass is the sacrifice, the same sacrifice of Calvary. And you've got to ask yourself a question. When you're at Mass, where are you? You are at Calvary. It's an unbloody sacrifice, but the same sacrifice. I remember one time I was preaching someplace, first mass, I think a vigil mass. The lector came in, he was kind of half drunk. The altar boys came in, and they're having a good old party in the sacristy, talking, laughing, telling jokes. It got to be 30 seconds from when mass started. Now, I'm a stranger every place I go, and strangers have to be a little bit careful. You don't want to step out of line. But I just couldn't take it anymore, and I said, hey, where, where, where are y'all going? Huh? Where are we going right now? Uh, oh, Mass. Yeah, what's that? What's that? They didn't have a clue. Let me tell you something, we're going back 2,000 years, and we're climbing a mountain, and there's a man lifted up on a cross, and his name is Jesus. And he's dying for you. We are going to Calvary. And what should our disposition be standing there at the foot of the cross? Our disposition should be that of Mary, St. John, and the pious women who stood there in solidarity with the Son of Man who suffered and died that we might live. This is the Mass. This is the Eucharist. And he shed his blood. That's the blood of the Lamb. That's the blood that sets you free. That's the blood that is your salvation. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be washed whiter than snow by the blood of the Lamb. Don't trample the blood of the Lamb underfoot. Be reverent at Holy Mass. Know what you're doing. Know what you are doing. At the words of consecration, a validly ordained priest and only a validly ordained priest confects the Eucharist. A miracle takes place. Plain bread, plain wine, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the words of consecration, change in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It is the Lord. Now there's another heresy about, and some of these theologians will tell you, well, a real presence, yes, but it's no different than the presence, the real presence of God in the Bible. God is really present in his Bible. That's a true statement. They're not lying. God is really present in his word. He is. And Jesus is really present in the sacraments and in the ministers of the sacrament. And in fact, he is really present in you. It's real. It's not a false present. That's a real present. However, they don't finish the story. Jesus is not really, truly, and here's the punchline, folks, substantially present except in heaven and in the Blessed Sacrament. This mode of presence in the Blessed Eucharist is different than any other mode of presence. It is the mode of presence par excellence, the highest mode of presence. It is God among us, Emmanuel, Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Body, blood, and soul speaks of the humanity of Christ. God is everywhere spiritually in virtue of his power as God. Body, blood, and soul speaks of the humanity of Jesus. United to the divinity, hypostatically as we say, subsisting in the divine person, it is the Lord, the fullness of presence. God's everywhere. But you're not going to find me outside adoring that oak tree. Is God out there? God's out there. I'm not crazy. Is God in you? You better believe it. You're a temple of God. I believe that and I 
respect you greatly because of that. But you're not going to find me on my face in front of you adoring you. It's very different. But when I come before the Lord at Holy Mass or in the tabernacle, I will fall down on my face. I will adore the living God. It is Him. That's very different from any other mode of presence. Now, if that's the truth, and I will die for that, that is the truth. That is the truth. That being the case, as one good Baptist minister friend of mine said to me, you know, Father, if I was you, I'd be the happiest man in the world. And I said, why is that, Pastor? He said, because if I believed what you believe, and in a sense, he, he's a good man. He said, I hope someday I do believe that. I hope I can, I can come to that. He said, but if I believe what you believe, I would go into that church, I would go in front of the Lord's presence in that tabernacle, and you couldn't pry me out of a church. Because if he is there, where else could I want to be? Pastor, you're not far from the kingdom. And he's not. But he's right. If we believe that, and we do, we're supposed to believe that, how can we take it so casually? You got a chapel of perpetual adoration in this diocese. Now, I know you have a, a lot of important things to do. We are all busy people. But I'm going to tell you something here before God. You don't have anything more important to do to, than spend time with Jesus in the Eucharist. You don't have anything more important than to go and spend a holy hour with the Lord. Now, I'm going to put something on you right now, and I hope it tortures you half to death if you don't listen to me. If you let this go in one ear and out the other ear, and you get back to business as usual, and you sit in front of your television an hour every night, and you don't go, and spend that time with Jesus in the Eucharist, I'm going to promise you something. When you go before God, he's going to ask you why. But I don't like wasting my breath. And I didn't come here to waste my breath. And God will hold you to that. But I'll tell you what will happen if you do it. You'll be the happiest person in the world. You'll be filled with power. You will have spiritual joy. You will be able to get through your life not limping and falling, you'll fly. He'll give you the wings of an eagle. Jesus is here. His presence in the Eucharist is the most enormous gift imaginable. We need to go to him. The Eucharist, of course, is food for the journey. I often tell people, you know, every now and then a good woman will come up to me at a mission and say, Oh, Father, you know, my, my husband's a good man. I said, oh, yes, ma'am, I'm sure he is. Says, and then come the punchline. But he don't go to church much. <laughs> but he's, he's a good man, you know. So, well, I'm sure he's a good man. But, you know, we have a supernatural end. And you cannot achieve a supernatural end through natural means. Natural means do not suffice to achieve a supernatural end. Sometimes people say, well, I don't get anything out of Mass, Father. I said, well, you bring to it. You don't get anything out of it? Well, you bring to it. There's a football game on tonight. I remember once sitting with a priest friend of mine from Kenya. He studied, he and I studied together in Spain. And he came and visited my mother and I in New York once, and Father Gabriel and I watched a football game. And he'd never seen a football game. They have soccer in Kenya. And so we were watching this, and, and he's looking at it, and he said, this, this doesn't make any sense at all. What are they doing out there? That, this is a stupid game. He didn't get anything out of that at all. Why? He didn't understand it. He didn't know what was happening. He didn't bring anything to it. So I helped explain the game to him. After a while, he kind of enjoyed it. And now he watches football games. And I don't know if I might have done a bad thing, but <laughs> he's probably watching that game tonight. But you see, you've got to bring something to your faith to get something out of your faith. How many people know what happens at Mass? No wonder we're bored. We don't understand that that's the most amazing event that takes place. It's a transcendent event. It is Calvary. You're there. That's the power of God. That's salvation unfolding. I tell people that don't even go to Mass on Sunday. They said, well, I, I don't really like I said, look, do you eat? Yeah, I eat. Do you think eating's important? Yes, eating's important. What will happen if you do not eat anymore? Well, I begin to get weak. My resistance is down and maybe I'll get sick and eventually I'll die. Amen, brother. 
Don't you think your soul deserves at least one good meal a week? <laughs> That's the truth. The bread of life, the cup of eternal salvation. Your soul is going to be either healthy or sick, alive or dead. So give it a break. At least bring it to Mass on Sunday and give it one good meal a week. Give it a chance to live. It's power. It's the sacrament of unity. I want to tell you the only way that authentic ecumenism will ever take place. It won't take place when we are ashamed of the fullness of our faith. It will not take place because we don't express everything we believe. Ecumenism is not to be brought about by burying Our Lady in a closet someplace and pretending that we don't love her. It's not to take place by failing to tell the fullness of what we believe in the Eucharist. When we bring out the fullness of truth, especially the Eucharist, it will draw people like a magnet. I have brought several people into the Catholic Church, including some Protestant ministers. One of them was a Pentecostal, four generations. His father and grandfather and great-grandfather were Pentecostal ministers. He started to come to hear me preach down in Florida. He sat right in the front row, and you could not miss Brother Don, because he was an easy 350. And he sat there right in the first row, and, and he is a very nice man, a very kind man. He was attentive. He knew the Bible. He came up to me. He'd been a, a, a minister 25 years. His wife had recently died. He'd suffered a lot. He was lonely, and he was kind of searching. So he just came, and he would listen to me. He, he heard that they got somebody that preaches like a Baptist over there at that Catholic <laughs> church. So he thought, this i got to see. So he went over there, and, and he, he came every day. And he would come up and politely ask me questions, and I tried to answer his question. And I was preparing the people to make the demont for consecration. About 60 people were being prepared to make the consecration to Jesus through Mary. And old brother Don said, well, maybe I'll do that too. So he, he sat through all this. And I remember the, the last day we were going to make the consecration the next morning at Mass. He came to me and said, uh, I, I've done this 33 days, this preparation. And, and he came to me about 10 o'clock at night in the rectory. He says, uh, Father, could you go over that again? <laughs> and so I did as best I could. He went home. He just couldn't come to it. He was well-meaning, but he sat in his chair all alone, he said, and he was trying to get it intellectually. He's kind of trying to figure out how Mary fit into all this. It goes against his, what he grew up with. What happened was, the next day he came, he made the consecration. He came, sat right in the front pew, stood right up, made that consecration, and I was amazed. And I said, Brother Don, what happened? He said, well, I went home last night, and there's no way I could do it. I just didn't think I was going to be able to do it. I sat down. And he said, and I had a strange sensation. I felt like a little boy. I felt like a little boy out watching the parade, and it was cold. And, and my mother took her coat and wrapped it around me. And I had a sense that I had a mother that loved me and wanted to protect me and wanted to give me everything good in the world. He said, and I knew that was the Blessed Mother. And so he made the consecration. But he wasn't ready to become Catholic. Several months later, I was preaching in San Antonio. A member of my evangelization team, her mother was dying, so I went to the house, celebrated Mass, Brother Don came. I was on my way to preach in Central America, in uh, Costa Rica and Nicaragua. And so I was celebrating Mass, Brother Don came, he sat down. I got to the offertory, and I said something I never normally say. I said, now we are entering into the sacrifice part of the Mass. We do not repeat the sacrifice of Calvary. See, a lot of Protestants think that, that, we, that we think we repeat Calvary. We don't repeat it. It was offered once for all. We do not repeat the sacrifice. We enter into it and make it present. It's a transcendent event. We enter into it and make it present. We don't repeat it. I said that and I went on. I came to the consecration. I elevated the host and out of the corner of my eye, Brother Don was shaking. He was shaking uncontrollably and he was crying, big tears coming down his eyes. So I finished Mass and I said, Don, what happened? He says, well, he said, you know, the last thing is the Eucharist. I mean, I, 
I, I already believe everything you Catholics believe except the Eucharist. I just couldn't come to that. You know, I just can't see how Jesus uh, can be in a piece of bread. And I just couldn't come to that intellectually. And so I couldn't give the assent of my faith to that. Once again, he said, I closed my eyes. I was just trying to pray. He was a very respectful, humble man. I was just trying to pray. I closed my eyes. And all of a sudden, there's Jesus. There's Jesus in all his splendor. And he smiled at me, and he held out his arms like this, and he said, Brother Don, enter in. <laughs> he took some catechesis and received his first Holy Communion on Christmas Day. And now, you know, he preaches as a lay evangelist in the Catholic Church. You know what he preaches on? Three things. He preaches on the Blessed Mother, he preaches on the Pope, and he preaches on the Eucharist. <laughs> My dear friends, don't ever take it for granted. The Eucharist is the greatest gift God's given to us. It's the healing power of God. We're going to have a Eucharistic kind of a healing service right after Mass. There's power in the Eucharist. It's the very power of Jesus Christ, the divine physician. I remember a story from my seminary days. A good friend of mine was diagnosed with cancer. He w we were in our third year, about to be ordained deacons, and he was diagnosed with cancer, and we all would go to visit him. He ended up in a hospice. He was dying, 43 years old. He was a good man. He loved the Eucharist. One thing about David, he loved the Eucharist. Uh, two of us would be in the chapel 5 o'clock every morning. I was there and he was there every morning until he got sick. So he's in this hospice run by good sisters. And it got towards the end. I went to visit him alone one day. I stopped in the chapel, prayed for him a little bit, and walked down the hall. I went into his room, and I beheld a sight that took me back 2,000 years. David's mother had moved into the hospice. She was holding her son in her arms. Now, David had been a 200-pound, big strapping man, fishing boat captain in his day, commercial fisherman. He was emaciated. I don't know how much he weighed, less than 100. And she was holding this emaciated son of hers. He was in great pain. The morphine no longer helped him. And so he, he was just in pain. The, the perspiration was coming down his face. His mother was wiping the perspiration off of my, uh, the pieta. That's all I could think of, mother and son. David was suffering, and I went in. He was too weak to speak. He motioned for me to come closer. I went up to him and knelt down, and he whispered in my ear, You can't believe the joy. You can't believe the joy to be one with Jesus, suffering, dying, on my way to resurrection. Power of the Eucharist. I left. A couple of days later, I was standing on the steps of the chapel of the, of the seminary. The rector was there, I was there, a couple of seminarians, and the sister who had taken care of him in his last days came, Sister Louis Marie, and she told us this story. She said, shortly after I left, David went into a coma. She called for the priest, couldn't find him, and eventually she got another priest who wasn't the chaplain. He came, but he couldn't do anything. David had already been anointed, but he, he was just laying there in that coma. But that priest, being a spiritual man, he had a pix, and he took the Blessed Sacrament. He took God himself, and he raised it up. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. And David sat bolt upright out of a coma. And the priest broke off a piece of the host and gave him viaticum, food for the last journey, the body of Christ. And David received Jesus. And the last three words out of his mouth or Alleluia! 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 And he fell down and he breathed his last. 
but he'd been filled with the Eucharistic power of the Lord, and he didn't go out with a whimper. He went out like Jesus who died on the cross with a mighty roar.